Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Show with Bill Hall. The show about stuff most people try to avoid, but can't because it controls their lives, religion, culture, and politics. Why does Bill Hall host this show? Because he and Bonhoeffer hoisted a few brews together in Berlin. Ah, uh, nope, that never happened. Is it that Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, both challenged and changed Bill as a young man? Well, yes, that is part of it. But it's primarily because Bonhoeffer called us to a costly discipleship. And there has never been a time when such courage has been more absent or desperately needed than now. Bonhoeffer famously said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. The Bonhoeffer Project is committed to turning leaders into disciple makers. Because if leaders fail to create disciple making movements, then we have failed. So, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's still tall and good looking. And yes, he is wearing German cologne. He's acquired a few more underlying conditions. But direct from his underground bunker in Long Beach, California, the man who once told Don Henley, you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave, Bill Hall. Thank you, Steve Simmons. Here we are. Season two. Can you believe there's actually a season two to the Bonhoeffer show? But it's going to be an exciting season. Uh, it's going to have a theme, a general overall theme, and it's going to be making different disciples for a dystopian age. You know, we talk about utopia. I used to live at the corner of Utopia and Grandee. Uh, utopia actually means nowhere. And it's because that so many people, when they're utopian in their philosophy, it means that they, they wish for a world of peace and prosperity and nobody ever gets angry with anyone else and, and everybody behaves perfectly. Everybody has a Stepford wife. Excuse me, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, everybody has a beautiful home. Uh, there's no poverty. Uh, nobody's too rich. Nobody's too poor. Everything is just wonderful. The problem is, if you want that kind of society, you have to control it with tyranny. Because that's just not the way humans are. Humans are hierarchical. Uh, some of us are more competent than others at various things and different things. Now, our value as human beings before God is that we're all of equal value to God. But we're not all the same. And so dystopian age means that it's a world crafted by uh a Gnostic viewpoint or a uh, atheistic viewpoint or a secular viewpoint uh, that doesn't recognize these great truths of Western civilization, these great truths of the scripture that we're all fallen and that we've lost our connection with God, our creator, and that creation, that, that connection then is re-established through redemption. And that God has visited us in a person, Jesus. And he is the Christ. He is the Savior. He indeed is the answer. And we are his disciples. And so dystopian means that our age is one where people are attempting to try to create a better world without God, and depending on all of us to be like God in order to do it. <laughs> it doesn't work. So this season, we're going to be talking about this whole issue of how would our disciples be different? Now, I'm out on an island by myself now, uh, just an old guy talking to himself. And to those of you who have subscribed to the Bonhoeffer Show, and I thank all of you. 
and I'm going to have you all over for dinner. Actually, there's quite a few of you, and uh, I'm thankful for that. So let's get started. Uh, the late but great statesman, diplomat, and scholar, and uh, Dr. Charles Malik, who was Lebanese, uh, who was with the United Nations and was a charter member, I believe, a, a signer of the Charter of the United Nations. He was a great scholar and statesman and Christian. And in 1982, he gave an address at Wheaton College at the establishment of the Billy Graham Center. And 10,000 people were there, including Billy Graham himself at that address. And he said this, the problem is not only to win souls. And yes, evangelicals particularly, but Christians over the time have always been concerned with souls because we are souls. We are immaterial nature. Uh, we are something different uh, than simply the material part of who we are. And he says, if the problem is not only to win souls, but to save minds. If you win the whole world and lose the mind of the world, you will soon discover you have not won the world. Indeed, it may turn out you have actually lost the world. In other words, you could have all kinds of people prayer, pray the prayer, walk the aisle, be baptized, become church members, uh, attend church on Sunday, and you think, wow, we've done it. We've won them over. Uh, in fact, there were statistics last year that in the last 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, rather, there were 50% of people in America identified as Christian, and today that has fallen in half. In other words, if, if look, think about it. If half of the people in America were Christian, game, set, match, think about it. Uh, we should have won the world. I mean, if all this stuff uh, that about the tipping point is true, 17% is all you need essentially to get that tipping point and then the movement begins, uh, then we should have uh, had no problem. But what's happened is the culture has changed. The culture has turned essentially more anti-Christian and less biblically oriented than ever before, at least in my lifetime. So essentially what's happened in the last 50 years is that we have made disciples in the churches, and we've made many, many, many disciples, thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of Christians have become followers of Jesus in one way or another, whatever that actually means in a particular subcultural context, yet those people have actually, we've lost the culture in the process. In the little book that Malik published on this theme, it was called The Two Task. The first task is to evangelize souls, and the second task is to evangelize minds. Malik warned us all of the left's long walk through our universities. Now, let me just mention what I mean by left. I don't mean Democrats, or uh, I don't mean the liberal tendency, uh, liberty, for example, or classic liberals, which means freedom of speech and so on. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking more about the philosophic left, the, the academy, uh, Marxism, uh, the communist impulse, the idea of eating things out, the idea that uh, we not only have equality of opportunity, but we have equality of result. And when you have equality of result, you always have to control it, again, with tyranny. With Just think Soviet Union, Venezuela, North Korea. Just think about some of those places, Cuba. Malik warned us about this long walk through the universities of the left. Uh, and also, he warned about the fact that we don't produce Christian scholars. Now, I thought that Billy Graham, Christianity Today, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Wheaton College, places like this, silly step, they did step up and produce really strong conservative scholarship. And they have. But apparently, it's just not enough. 
He says, if uh, you don't populate faculties in the universities, you will produce future generations of leaders who are cut off from their nation's history and first principles. I think that's really happened, don't you? Now, 40 years on, Malik's warning has become our reality. The, the American Revolution was about equality of opportunity and required liberty and morality to flourish. In other words, people have to have the will to want to obey the laws they make. The French Revolution was about equality of result and it required tyranny in the guillotine. Maximilien Rospierre, remember him? If you read any of your history, he was uh, an instigator of the whole idea of the French Revolution and then the tyranny required to get people to fall in line. And of course, he was guillotined himself. It eats its own. The present revolutionaries running through the streets of America don't know the difference between Marxist socialist theory taught in most of our universities, and it's been dumbed down to burn it down, tear it down, shut it down, shut them up, and we will have a utopia of freedom and equality. You know, we're just one burned building, one statue on the ground more, just one assassination away from utopia, it'll all be perfect. This imaginary world, it means no place because it doesn't exist. It, its advocates are primarily nihilistic, who believe in nothing. What does it, you know, think about uh, society that is a dehumanizing and unpleasant. Uh, it's a tyrannical witch's brew of Huxley's Brave New World, Orwell's 1984, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Huxley's fear was no one would read or be informed because we would assume our, uh, uh, would, uh, we would actually amuse ourselves to death. No one would read or be, be interesting and, uh, and, or be informed or uh, educated. Orwell warned a big brother who would control our thoughts, words, and punishes those who violate those codes. And if you can't say it, you can't refine it, you can't articulate it, you can't really think clearly about it. And so Bradbury portrayed a, a society of betrayal and distrust, a world of censorship and denial of liberty. That's what we call dystopia. <laughs> It's alarming, if you care to be alarmed, that our present revolutionaries, uh, those that we see in the street even right now, as I record this today, they know the difference between MLK and BLM, Martin Luther King, Black Lives Matter. Martin Luther King's protests were peaceful, principled, built on the Christian narrative reflected in the Declaration of Independence that he called America's promissory note. If you read his letter from the Birmingham jail, it's quite an education in what he really believed. And of course, King was a sinner. Uh, we all are. All of us have fallen short of God's standard, but that doesn't invalidate his life any more than the sins of the church cancel out its ideas and its message. One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We live to please God and to worship him only. Black Lives Matter, the motto is different from Black Lives Matter, the organization, because the organization holds to a very different creed. They are deceiving the public by marching through our culture, not to improve it, but to destroy it. Yes, to bring it down, to redefine the family, to break down the heterosexual dominance, as they would call it, and to make any valid, uh, to make invalid any configuration of what we call the standard family. If there's one thing that must be done to address the problem of black underclass and gang violence and bad schools and fatherless families, it's to strengthen the black family. A major change will need for the government to end its patronage system. And as Wall Street journalist columnist Jason Riley recently said in a book, please stop helping us. 
Now, we are at war. It's a cultural war. Uh, I don't know how you avoid it. I'd like to avoid it. I'd rather not do it. But it's a war of ideas. And behind those ideas are persons, and finally only two persons, God and Lucifer. This is, this is fundamental. We are in what writer Michael Walsh in his so eloquently calls the devil's pleasure palace. In his high cultural exposition, the devil's pleasure palace, a cult of critical theory and the subversion of the West, he describes it this way. A modern, it's a modern devil's pleasure palace is a Potemkin village built on the promises of social justice. Now, a Potemkin village is named after a, a Russian czar or Russian a potentate of a certain region who was a friend of Catherine the Great. But it's the idea that it's a facade. It's like a fake city. It's like a movie set. So it's a village, but it's not a real village. It's just a facade. It's just the front of the buildings. So it's built, uh, it's a pleasure palace. is a Potemkin village built on the promises of social justice and the equality for all, a vision of the world at Last divorce from toil and sweat, and every man and woman is guaranteed a living, a world without hunger or cold or fear or racism or sexism or any other of the isms. But the corpses of untold millions have died in the attempts of many to found this kingdom of heaven here on earth. Yet something very wicked has come our way, ladies and gentlemen. And we are to fight, we're in the fight of our lives. How or even whether we choose to fight is not the subject. It's not the purpose of this podcast. The subject is why we must engage. Now, I don't mean that this is primary political. In fact, the, the whole thesis of the Bonhoeffer show is that, that all of society is built upon the upstream issue of worldview or religion. And then downstream of that, and we get to midstream really, you get the culture. The culture is the way we relate to one another, the way we live, our customs, and so on. And then finally, politics reflects it. So this is not, politicians uh, as a whole are not thought leaders. They are thought reflectors. They reflect what the culture is saying and then what the upstream indicators start things and the instigators and the forms. So the worldview is really what matters. And that's really where we're talking about. This is the fundamental thing about what's really behind this whole thing. Well, it's God and Lucifer in battle. And you might remember in Milton's uh, Paradise Lost, uh, essentially the scene opens with Satan or Lucifer chained to the floor of the abyss or hell, and he finally frees himself to fight. And he, he, he and his minions, they go to fight. And who do they fight? They're attacking what God loves most, his creation, to destroy it. He knows he can't win but he's going to fight anyway. And that's who we're fighting. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and evil forces in high places. Well, now, I've had enough for a minute. Uh, I need to rest. And so we're going to take a break and listen to Steve Simmons of how you can become part of the Bonhoeffer Project. Uh, we're growing. It's developing. I'll tell you, there's so much happening around the world. Uh, in this movement because we turn leaders into disciple makers. So let's take a break. We turn leaders into disciple makers. That's the mission of the Bonhoeffer Project. But before we can turn you into a disciple making leader, we need you to be in a cohort. A cohort is a one year, 10 meeting, book reading, Pray, wrestling, writing, planning, challenge that has the potential to change you and thus redirect your life. Interested? Here's the process. Go to our website, thebonhofferproject.com, and complete the application form. 
We will contact you. We will then help you select the type of cohort that's best for you. In person, online, or online school, which is asynchronous, so it's not affected by time zones and anyone in the world can access it. Oh, and training is now also available in Spanish. In the meantime, subscribe to the show, read one of Bill's books, and send us a question you want Bill or some member of the Bonhoeffer team to answer. And now, back to the show. Thank you, Steve. His voice is still golden. Now, why should we, as a church, dirty our hands and join this fight? Why not just stick to souls? Because our disciples have failed. I mean, our, meaning the churches, because we have lost the culture. Now, somebody might say, well, why? Have we ever won the culture? Have we ever been in charge? Well, yeah, we have uh, temporarily at different times, and it depends on what you mean by in control. For example, uh, if you have an army, uh, like a pope had some, he had an army and a band, and he used to go to war, and, and uh, there, there's all kinds of stuff like that going on in the Middle Ages. Uh, but essentially, um, when we've been in charge, things haven't gone so well. To be, to be honest. So we're not really very good at being in charge, and that's good because God really doesn't call us as followers of Jesus to be in charge. We're simply his servants, his representatives. And, uh, but we need to be salt and light, don't we? A salt is a preservative to give flavor, to, to give taste, and light to illuminate in the darkness, uh, to be a faithful witness of Christ our Lord. That's essentially our calling. And we need to engage the culture because that's where we live, work, and play. If you care about what happens with our children, if you want to be a steward of the environment, good. If you want to be a steward of the, of the spiritual environment, even better. If you'd like your children taught real history in schools, yes. If you'd like for your children to be uh, brought up in a world where right is right and wrong is clear, it's not truth as a category has not collapsed. So it really does matter if you care about this generation, the next generation, the health of our country, the health of the world. It's not really just about winning and losing. It's not about saving the world. We, we're incapable, really, of saving the world, but we can make the world better. I mean, I think pretty much everybody of almost all philosophies agrees with that. Let's, let's leave it better than we found it. So it's about stewardship. And as and just to be minimalistic about it, but we've been making our kinds of disciples for the past 50 years, and look what we've accomplished. The disciples that we have produced have allowed the culture to be taken over by, again, leftist ideology that is clearly anti-Christian, anti-gospel, and has cut off at least two generations from the biblical, literary, social, and cultural foundations of a working society. Because I think that people quote from the Federalist Papers a lot, they, they quote from our uh, founding fathers, and one of the things that's clear is that they knew that there had to be a, a moral people if you want to have a free society. A free society will collapse in the chaos unless there is standard, strong character. And that cannot be imposed from the outside. It has to come from inside. It has to be part of the human character. It's an individualistic issue, not only a systemic issue. Now, uh, there are young people today out in the streets. They tear down statues. And a lot of these kids are our disciples. They, have, they went to our churches, 
And now they are marching in the streets and they don't even know why they're there. You know, I have a friend who's about 80. And uh, in 1968, he was marching uh, down the streets of Chicago at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, they were invited over to Dick Gregory, the comedian's apartment. Uh, there, the Chicago Seven were in the immediate area. Uh, the Chicago police and Mayor Daley, they were uh, out there with the billy clubs and uh, things were getting really nasty at the 1968 Democratic National Convention and the protests and so on. And uh, he said that he was marching down the street. Uh, he was in his 20s. He wasn't sure why he was marching down the street. He, it was more, it was social. He thought he was doing a good thing. Uh, it was a good impulse, I suppose you might say. It was something to do. Uh, and, and I think all these things come into play in young people, uh, how they get caught up in all these kinds of things. They, they have a good impulse. I'm not saying that they have a terrible impulse. Uh, but then they have other people who take advantage of their youthfulness, uh, of their naivete, and they, they stimulate them and encourage them to break the law, to tear down statues, to uh, throw rocks through windows, to beat up people, to scream and yell and curse and do all the kinds of things that actually they were taught not to do, to be lawbreakers. And so those young people, there's a lot of people in America who are young, naive, impressionable, and it's leaders who really make the difference of what happens with them. And as Christian leaders, we must make different disciples in order to get a different result. In other words, what causes that young person to stop and go, wait, what am I doing here? Maybe I shouldn't go across this line. Maybe I shouldn't hit this person. Maybe I shouldn't kick that person on the ground. Maybe I shouldn't go in and loot out of that store. Maybe I should just turn and go home, or maybe I should do something different. Maybe I should try to be a peacemaker. What causes that to happen? Well, the church must take some responsibility as to why our members have not created our own companies. For example, why don't we, why haven't evangelicals made movies? They've made movies, but let's face it, they've been pretty bad. Anybody seen Without Onion? That was one of Billy Graham's films back in the day. Sorry, Billy, but some of those films were kind of interesting. Uh, the, uh, so uh, we had our own Amazon. What, you know, we haven't created the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, the movie studios, the television networks. All of these things have not really been what we have done. Uh, the new titans who run our society. So where do we begin? But well, let me suggest one place as a starting point that has not changed in 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul said, here is where you begin. Now, there's other entry points, but this is a fundamental one. And so uh, to the church at Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, here, here's what he says. We are human, but we don't wage war. Now, we know that we are at war. Christians we, we are on a war footing, always have been. But we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So you see, again, this is not primarily a political fight. I know that that's the place where so many of us engage and it's so easy to engage. Like right now, as I record today, we're right in the middle of the Republican National Convention. It's online, of course, in the COVID experience. Last week was the Democrats, so they gave a worldview. This week, we're getting a separate worldview. All right, so we have to think about that. We have to decide which worldview are we uh, in agreement with or what uh, hybrid are we in agreement with, or what is, what is it we actually believe? So we use God's mighty weapons, and we have to define what those mighty weapons are, and 
strongholds of human reasoning, okay? So there are arguments that we've just touched on just a little bit today in the program uh, about uh, the, you know, what, 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 what some people would call utopia is a dystopia, all right? So some people say, well, the problem with communism is it's never been tried. Well, of course, that's laughable. Uh, just the pile of corpses, 100 million of them in the 20th century, is enough to establish that it has been tried and uh, see what the result was. But you have to argue these points at the deeper levels, upstream, not even mid or down, but upstream, worldview. What lie, lies behind all of this? So not worldly weapons that knock down the strongholds of human reasoning to destroy false arguments. We destroy, now what's a false argument? We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. That's the clarifying, that's the clarifying statement. That if it keeps you from knowing God, it's a false argument. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Okay, more on this in a minute. Uh, we're going to take another break and hear from Steve Simmons. If you want to expand the disciple-making movement, then share the show with your friends and colleagues. Hey, it's easy to subscribe. Simply go to iTunes or to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, then click on The Bonhoeffer Show. Once you do, we will keep you updated with The Bonhoeffer Project's events, new materials and books, as well as the larger disciple-making movement current news. You can also access previous programs. And be sure to read Bill's weekly column, which is posted on the website. Remember, ask questions. Bill's answers are guaranteed to give you herd immunity, increase your IQ, and cause you to experience waves of euphoria. Well, not really, but his answers are really good. And now, let's get back to the Bonhoeffer Show. Well, thank you, Steve. And by the way, my wife says that uh, she just ordered a new freezer for our garage. So, uh, hey, buy this book, okay? Uh, this is uh, the most controversial book I think I've written, Conversion and Discipleship of the 30 Books. But this book particularly uh, is, says that you, you know, uh, conversion and discipleship, you can't have one without the other. And one of the statements I make in this book, right in the start, in fact, uh, I think I put it up front, uh, right with the introductions, but here it is. Some believe you can have conversion without discipleship. You know anybody like that? I believe that the proof of conversion is discipleship. Now, that's created a lot of conflict thankfully, uh, in church meetings. You know, in the Bonhoeffer Project, we've, this year we'll have graduated our 1,000th leader. We turn leaders into disciple makers. And a lot of these conversations have ensued in local churches around the gospel, because the gospel we believe in determines the disciple we make. And the disciple we make, then, either is either going to be able to make an impact for Christ or not will either be activated or not. So that's something that I just want to continue to emphasize. So Jane says, hey, I need a new freezer. Buy some of these books, and we'll get the new freezer. All right? Thank you. Now, uh, current events. Yeah, current events. I uh, saw something yesterday that really bothered me. Well, it should bother anyone because it's so rude. But a group of uh, Black My Lives Matter young people, some of these, I think, largely naive, uh, well-meaning, think they're probably doing good things, young people, approach some diners. And I mean, this is like 
20 people, maybe even more. And they began berating this woman who was seated and, uh, at, at a table outside of a restaurant. And they had her surrounded and they were up in her face and they were telling her, they're essentially telling her, raise your fist and chant Black Lives Matter and or we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to yell at you, we're going to intimidate you, uh, we're going to do all these things. And uh, then one person pointed her finger, I said, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? It reminded me, and uh, it reminded me of the scene in uh, 1984, uh, Two Minutes of Hate, where people would come into a room, and uh, they were required to be there, of course, and then the, the face of the uh, revolutionary anti, uh, the, their antichrist, the person who was against what uh, the teaching of the head of the Oceana, which is their country, uh, would represent. And they would hate on this guy and scream uh, and uh, just rate, everybody's blood pressure was very high. It was going on like that, and it was just an awful thing. And just you can see the hate on their faces. And it was, seemed to me the same thing. It was like uh, BLM's two minutes of hate on this woman. And then they showed some other scenes like that. So, you know, that, that is the kind of what we call, remember, equality, equality of opportunity versus equality of result. Everybody has to get in line. Everybody has to agree. It's like uh, in 1984, there's the scene where uh, Winston Smith, who is the main character, is being persecuted. He's being uh, tortured. And the, uh, the torturer says, how many fingers am I holding up? And he was holding up four fingers. And Winston Smith said, I see four fingers. And he said, no, how, how about, don't you see the fifth finger? There's five fingers. And uh, so until, and he kept turning up, uh, and he kept turning up the the machine, which created the pain and the agony, until finally he says, okay, I see five, I see five. Well, that's sort of what's going on in our culture, is uh, the cancel culture. And it's very disturbing. It is. And uh, I don't like it, and I don't think most people like it. So I know that people think that they're doing good things, that they're probably changing society, that they're part of the revolution, but actually it violates human nature and people will not put up with it very long. Now, let's go back to uh, this three-pronged strategy of uh, how we implement war, the war we're in. First of all, know your enemy. We know that it's not flesh and blood. Secondly, cultural and conceptual apologetics. Teach ourselves, teach our children. Make the dinner table a supper with Socrates. You know, Socrates was known as the wisest man in Athens. And what did he do? He didn't really have a written philosophy. He just walked around Athens and he asked questions and he would dissect people's philosophies with his questions. That's what they called Socratic method, asking questions. And so Socrates would ask all these questions, and of course he had to drink the, the hemlock, but uh, that didn't turn out so well for him, but he, that's what he chose. That's what he chose as, versus some other form of death. But I, I think that we need to teach our children about the culture. We need to teach our children about biblical worldview. We need to equip them so that when they go to school, when they go to university, when they sit down as young adults and they're having dinner with other people, that they've had these discussions already. That's part of how we deal with this, is education. 
And then there's the allure of gentleness. You know, one of the, my favorite books of Dallas Willard is The Allure of Gentleness. You know, Dallas would not debate. He was just, he said, debate is just a way of getting people to shut up. And so he wasn't really interested in that. And God bless him. I know there's many other people who are debaters and need to be debaters, and I'm for debaters. But Dallas, he just wasn't led in that way. He would have been a great debater because he played all 88 keys on the piano, on the philosophical piano. He did. But Dallas really said, uh, you know, first Peter 3.15 was much more of what he was into, which essentially is uh, be prepared to give an account of the hope that's within you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And it goes on to talk about how people will ask you about, because of your manner of life, they will ask you about that life. They'll ask you about why you're that way. And then that, that, the door is open and people will listen and there'll be discussion. So all of this is part of this uh, strategy of how to wage war along with prayer. Uh, don't, this is the, the ultimate divine weapon, prayer. So we're going to say more about this in future programs. But, uh, you know, for today, I need to take a break. I'm getting tired. And uh, out here on my virtual island all alone, a guy just talking. And uh, God bless you. And remember, as uh, subscribe to the Bonhoeffer Show. And, and also, remember, my wife wants you to buy this book because she needs the freezer. All right? So we'll see you. And remember, follow Jesus, and he'll teach you everything you will ever need to know. Well, we hope that the show wasn't too bad. Jane Hull wants everyone to know that if anything Bill said was offensive, <laughs> she feels your pain. If you were upset by anything Bill and his guests said, well, <laughs> mission accomplished. At the Bonhoeffer Show, we value irreverent, satirical, and generally inappropriate behavior. But when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission, we don't mess around. Remember, subscribe. We promise. No private jets, no white suits, and definitely no toupees.